nervous about going to Vietnam? Oh, yeah. Somebody told you they weren't. They're, they're, they're lying to you. Everybody's nervous because it's something It's you don't know what's going on. It's unpredictable. You heard stories and everything is all jumbled up in your mind and you're thinking, oh, my gosh, you know. Probably you're 19, you know, you don't, you don't think nothing's going to happen to you. Right? So, you know, it was a new adventure, let's put it that way. An adventure you can live without. Ready? All right, we're good to go. Okay. I was born in Rockford, Illinois, October 30th, 1948. My mo mother was uh, Ethel and Highland, and she was a machine operator at Modern Metal. And my dad, he's an asbestos worker. His name was Theodore Highland. It was great. I was the only child, so I, was a, so I had a pretty good I average, just an average student. Yeah, I liked history. History and psychology. That was my favorite. Well, I loved history because I liked looking old time, like in World War II and Korean War. I liked to watch different things like that. And then I liked to see how the American Revolution went along. Yeah, that all interested me. Now, after I got out of high school, I got graduated in 1967 out of Harlem. I went to uh, work with my dad in, in uh, construction for about six months. And then I decided, well, I was gonna get drafted anyways, I don't wanna to go to the Army, so I went to the Marines. Probably should have went to the Army, but <laughs> I went to the Marine Corps. I was 19. Were you aware, when you were in high school, were you aware of what was going on in Vietnam? Were you paying attention? Yeah, I was a little bit. Yeah, a little bit, but not, not as much as I should have, let's put it that way. Yeah, I had a few friends that got drafted. Then I had a real good friend, uh, Phil Nichols, he got killed in Vietnam. He graduated with us. Why choose the Marine Corps? Well, I had a few relatives, you know, from uh, my, uh, that had the Marine Corps, tried to tell me how tough it is and all this. I thought, well, I'll try it. And like a fool, I tried it. <laughs> well, when I went went to Chicago, we had to go through our physicals and that. And then after the physicals, came home for a week. Then I went back to Chicago, and then they shipped us out to, I went to San Diego boot camp. Oh my gosh, first day. And we got there the first day. They, in fact, we got there at night, I think about 11 o'clock, they stood us on these footprints. You stood on footprints waiting to get your head shaved. They, they don't care if you had moles in your head or not. People are coming out of their head bleeding because they had you know, moles and that. Oh gosh. It, they, they woke you up right away. I never had any trouble in boot camp or anything. I, I felt sorry for a lot of these other guys who were kind of heavy set. They put them in Fat Man's platoon. And they put them just strictly on lettuce. That's what they ate. Swam in sand. Oh gosh, you wouldn't believe what they did to these people. Or like the mental, they try to get you broke, broke down mentally. And that's, they tell you that at the beginning. It's either going to make it the first week or you're not going to be here. There was a lot of them who didn't make it. Staff Sergeant Biscuit, that's what his name is. We used to go up. And we had Gunnery Sergeant Fikuri, then Staff Sergeant Hickman. All three of them are DIs. Oh, God, they were terrible. <laughs> I remember them well. That's when you can still remember their names after all these years. Oh, gosh, we had drills. 
intervals every day. We'd get up in the morning at four, we'd run three miles, then we'd eat, eat breakfast. And then after breakfast, they put us on the parade field. And we prayed, for, oh gosh, about three hours. Then we'd go to lunch, then we'd come back, then we'd go to classes, you know, teach you different things. And then I think about eight o'clock, you go to bed. See, when I was in the Marine Corps, they didn't have barracks. We had Quonset huts that were from the Second World War that we lived in. Oh gosh, I think there was about 10 guys to a Quonset hut. And you had a stove in it, because at nighttime there in California, it get, does get chilly, especially where I, I went in in January. And you couldn't light those stoves because they got to stay shiny. So you just froze your butt off at night. <laughs> after I went to boot camp, and then I went after that, we went to Camp Pendleton for ITR, which was infantry training. And after infantry training, they give us 30 days to come home on leave. And then when I came back on leave, we went to what they call staging battalion. Well, that's for two weeks. And they try to treat, teach you survival things and different things like that, because we're getting ready to go to Vietnam. We don't have two week notice. I met her right before I went to Vietnam. You know, we wrote in that, you know, broke up a couple times. You know how that goes. When I came back from Vietnam, God, I think it was home, maybe. I still had a year and a half left in service when I married Grandma. So has your bald head that one or Yeah, that's, that's what I said to her. <laughs> it must have been my bald head. Oh, I really look terrible. And I had a ring around my head where out of boot camp, you're in the sun all the time. I would stand here, wait up here. <laughs> then after that two weeks, then they pack you up, you send to Okinawa. They found out I was a so surviving son. So I had to sign a thing to release them before I could go to Vietnam. They offered me to stay, but I'd stay in Okinawa. And I didn't want to stay in Okinawa. All my buddies are headed, headed there, so I think, I might as well. <laughs> Yeah, I sure do. We landed at the airport there in Da Nang. We got off and all, I mean, it stink. Man, as soon as you walk off that plane, Vietnam stunk. Oh, geez. It's really hard to describe it. It was a smell like decaying bodies, blood, and and you smell their, oh God, it, it's just hard to explain. It's really t bad smell. You know, but after you're there about a week, you don't notice it. Then you, know, you just get used to the smell. As soon as we got off the plane, everybody scared, trying to run to a place to hide. We had to stay there for about two hours, and because you hear the shelling coming in. And in fact, there's one hooch right beside us they hit, and then there was another one right up in front of us once hooch over. Yeah, they were, they rocking us almost all the time, you know. You never know where they're going to hit. They don't know where it's going to hit. That was just a 50-50 chance for them. Because I thought to myself, what did I get into? <laughs> But once you get there, it takes you about a month to actually get used to being in a place like that. Because, you know, you got to watch out all the time. Because during the day, the Vietnamese are roaming around, you're all your friends and everything. And at nights, they're in black pajamas. I see that quite a bit over there. So you really have to watch your toes oh, 24 hours, really. We did, anyways. I served in Da Nang in Vietnam. I was with the Marine Corps Air Wing 1. I was a chopper gunner. And day in and day out, we either medevac or drop troops in, bring troops out. That's our deal. And make cover for the troops who are driving out. We got six in there. And that, that squished in pretty good. Because if it flew a Huey, they look a lot bigger looking at them than they are on the inside. They're, they're pretty compact. We had a captain as a pilot. And the co-pilot, he was a warrant officer. You know, same crew, same same captain. He stuck pretty good, unless they get transferred out, you know, rotating home. Because at that time, they did everybody individually rotating people. You don't go over there as a company or anything like that. You're, you're, you're rotated one person at a time. It depends on what MOS, what's called Military Occupational Service, you are. Then they rotate you. Sometimes a half hour flight, sometimes 40 minutes. It just depends on where we're at when we take off. Because if we're in the air, at the base, it really varies from wherever you have to be sent. Up north, well see, the Nang ain't that far from uh, North Vietnam itself. And that's where we were stationed in. Four or five miles of North Vietnam. And then we, they had troops over in Cambodia. 
Yeah, I flew into Cambodia twice. See, that's supposed to be off limits. But we had to pick up troops. <laughs> you could have four or five missions one day. It depends on how high the landing zone is and whatever they had planned for the day for you dropping troops off. And then when you got medevacs, you fly in there no matter what it is. You just take your chance. But you gotta get the guys out. Now, you usually get a call of medevacs usually about three times a day at least. Sometimes we're in the air and sometimes we're back in base. It just depends on what the fuel is, how much fuel is left on the helicopter. I thought it was a good ship. It was a good ship, yeah. It's like the skin's thin on them, you know. It won't take much to knock them down. And by, by the middle, I imagine, Vietnam, uh, NVA, they pretty well had it figured out how to shoot them down. They, they shot them down quite a bit. And, you know, they lead ahead and fly right into it. Just a lot. I've seen, uh, I've seen a lot of blood guts because we did a lot of medevacs. And when you do medevacs, it's just hit and run. When you do medevacs and you bring them back, they got them just so, so much patched up. We, see, in the Marine Corps, we have corpsmen. They're from the Navy. They're the ones that like the medics for the Army. But ours is corpsmen. They just patch them up a little bit with a pressure bandage or something. We take them off, and there's nothing we can do for them as long as they're in, in movement. We just take them to the, to the hospital. The first time I seen it, it kind of upset me. But after you're there a while, you know, you just, it just comes nature for you. You're thinking about it, but you're not thinking about it. You know what I'm saying? And we were only 19 at the time when I went over there. So like I said, but good thing they get you when you're young because when you're young, you don't think about death. When you get older, you say, hey, I ain't gonna do this. <laughs> I might get hurt. But that's why they want them young. We were completely safe because we got missile quite a bit. And we had two hoochies got knocked out and killed about 20 people. They call it the red alert. We have to go out at night and we'll get in bunkers because that's when the VC are around the airport. And that, had, that happened about at least two or three times a month. Out the trenches, they call it. And you're out there all night waiting. And then you get relieved in the morning. Then they call off the alert and back to business. The Vietnamese, they were different. We went out to a village one time. And it was a refugee place. And we all got a bunch of us got a bunch of candy, especially from our care packages, you know. So we went out there, and some of them had their legs blown off, the little kids, you know, stepping on mines. And we're going out there, and they're all hugging on you, you know, and you're giving out, that, that was my best time. We came back, we had hoochies, what they called hoochies. And we come back, we stay there and we sleep, and we were lucky too, we had a chow hall. They had mama sons, Vietnamese, they come into the camp, and they, do your laundry, or they don't, this and that. And then uh, one day, I'm not lying to you, they got rats over there. You seen that dog I had? Yeah. Bigger than that dog. And we shot one rat, his mama son got it. And I smelled something stinking, and she was cooking it in the back. They, they, eat, they eat rats, they eat just about anything. I never trust them, I don't trust them now. You know, maybe it's a bad thing, I don't know. Think all together different than we do. To them, that's right, and to us, it's wrong, but I, I just just don't trust them. Oh, Viet Cong, they were bad, but they weren't bad as NVA, North Vietnamese Army. They were trained pretty good, but the Viet Cong, they were just a hit and miss, and it, you never know how many of them it's going to be, and they they do wear black pajamas, but not all of them do. Like I said, during the day, they're out there real friendly to you. One I'd seen, they let, they, he, in fact, he was inside. He was doing work there for, for the military inside the compound. There was a firefight. I seen him. He was dead. He was with the Viet Cong. See, the, you don't know. And so you really can't trust him. I, I don't trust him today. <laughs> I hate to say that, but I don't. I hate to say this. In Vietnam, they had a lot of beer flowing. And honestly, that's how you relieve your stress. You know, when you get back in the rear, and uh, they call it Freedom Hill. That's where you send people up on a run, and you get beer runs, get your pop, and all that stuff. I mean, it was big commissary up there. In fact, that's where Bob Hope was. You usually drink a few beers, kind of relax you. And you, don't, you don't drink to your numb or anything. You just drink a few beers, relax, but that's about it. Quite a bit of marijuana smoking. 
And then I heard it's, some guys were getting into heroin. But there, there was quite a bit of that going on. It wasn't unusual to see it. In Vietnam, all we did was we wrote letters. And then, like I said, they drink a lot of beer over there when you're off, you know, away from combat. Oh, we had some funny memories back there. After you're there about four or five months, they give you in-country R&R. You go to China Beach, you swim in the China Sea. Mainly what it is, a bunch of, everybody gets down there for their R&R, &R, they're drinking. That's all you do is drink down there. Well, we had a guy, he kind of passed out. We were on the beach, so what we did, we take shaving cream, put it all over the top of his head, and sent him out for a beer run. <laughs> he came back and he's running and said, Funny guy, it's funny. <laughs> I was wondering why everybody's looking at me weird. <laughs> we used to put him a shaving cream on his head when he went there. And then one time, I was on a regular R&R in &R, Bangkok, Thailand. And I've even seen it in the movies where they get the flutes and the cobras coming up. Well, they had one right outside our door. As you're going out the hotel door, and there was four of us sitting there. The guy is playing his flute, and here comes that cobra out of that uh, uh, basket. And he's real, so then he hit another tone, and the cobra went like this. All of us jumped back, but the one guy jumped back, he peed his pants. <laughs> he was got so scared. Oh, that was, that was a funny time. Just by letters. Yeah, I, wrote, I try to write as much as I can. And my mom, I got a letter from her every day, just about, you know, when the mail call came in. Yeah, she called and wrote me quite a bit. Then she'd send me pictures of all, everybody around, see what, tell me what they're doing on that. Yeah, that, that helped. The worst part I had about it was Christmas. And the holidays didn't bother me. Just Christmas, I don't think it was just me, I think it was a lot of you guys, because everybody was pretty depressed around Christmas time. And that was the first Christmas I was ever away from home. Yeah, we were doing a medevac. We were coming in for a medevac. And it was hot LZ, and they said, well, you know, everything, they always tell you, be careful. And we went down, and we, oh gosh, we must have been, oh, I want to say, 40 feet from the ground. And they can get a lucky shot right on our tail. And once that tail goes out, you're, you're going down no matter what. So we're lucky we weren't high up when we got shot down, but it destroyed the helicopter. That, that's something you never forget. And the big boom, it hit you. You know, when it first hit you, you think, oh, shit, excuse my French. And we, I think we had two medevacs on there, so we, we got them out. We just got through dropping off. I think there was only 25 guys down there. So it was a hot LZ, so they didn't bring anybody else in. And we had to stay there all day, the first day, then overnight, another day, then overnight. The nights are bad. Oh, that's really bad at night. <laughs> I mean, you, oh, it's hard to explain that one. It's scary because you're you're always hearing all kinds of noises. And we were on the ground for about three days before they came in and finally got us out. And thank God for the grunts. They kind of protected us, though. And then the, that following day, they got a helicopter and got us medevac down. But they said two out of five gunners don't make it back. So I made it back, I was lucky. The day before I left Vietnam and they get you all set, everybody set aside who goes where and what goes well. And as you're going out, they got a group of guys coming in. That's when I told you about that uh, Staff Sergeant Bissett, my old DI, uh, he was scared to death. Man, he was just shaking, looking around, you know. <laughs> so I went up to him, I said, do you remember me, Staff Sergeant Bissett? Yeah, you're Highland. I said, yeah, that's me. I said, I'm going home, I hope you have a good time. <laughs> So that, that was uh, that was exciting. I was, I was glad to see him getting there. Uh, he'd never been to Vietnam. It was his first tour, and he was a staff surgeon. He'd been in about 12, 13 years. We came home. First, we stopped in Okinawa on the way home, like we did on the way out. But we were there instead of two days. We were there about five days. That's to get all our stuff back out of the storage. And then they let us go on leave out, out in the town of Okinawa. Yeah, we stayed there, and then after that, they flew us into L.A. airport. But they told us when we left, go into groups, go at least two or three people. Because at that time, they were really marching, calling us baby killers and everything else. And I guess quite a few different service people got jumped by these people. So they said, stay together, stay at least two or three people. Yeah, and I flew into Chicago, over here, 
oh man, I was tired because it was a long flights there and back. And uh, I got off the plane and I said, we just walked out and all of a sudden someone swooped me up. It was my dad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was, that was kind of hard. Real good. We didn't. I didn't have no trouble once you got back to Rockford. And that, you didn't hear anything bad about what they want to say to the service people or not. They treated you real good. I thought I didn't have no problem. I came home and talked to them. I had something to eat, you know. In fact, because they picked me up at the airport. And time we got home, I was so tired. I said I gotta go to bed. I went in the bed. Well, it was kind of soft. So I wasn't used to soft bed, so I had sleeping on the floor. The next morning, my mom came in. What are you doing on the floor? I said, Ah. Oh, I couldn't, couldn't sleep in that bed. <laughs> I was so used to sleeping in something rough. And I did that for about, gosh, a good month, I think, before I finally got accustomed enough to get in bed. It's a little different when you first get back. Loud noises, crowds. I still don't like crowds. Still don't like loud noises. They were still demonstrating against Vietnam when I got home, too. And I didn't care for that, because I thought there's too many young kids got killed for this. If you like it or dislike it, you gotta go along with the troops. Thousands of demonstrators opposed to the Vietnam War assembled in the nation's capital for a mass protest. Yeah, it was around real big. Everybody knew about that. Some of them were for it, some of them were against it. I see when I was in Vietnam too, in Okinawa, they had a big race riot with the Marines, blacks and whites. And I see they tried to hush that up, but it you know, came back to us over here in Vietnam. Yeah, I, I, I guess that was pretty bad. Where was I when the war ended? I was home. And I was out of the service time. See, I got out in January of 72. In fact, it was the 25th of January. And I think the war lasted to about 73, almost 73, something like that. I was with the VFW for a while, but I, you know, I haven't been there since I got older. I just haven't been there anymore. I believe in war, like they did with 9-11, attacked us. But for us to say to go out there and just start something, like Russia did with uh, Ukraine, I don't believe in that. Russia did the wrong thing, because Ukraine wasn't doing anything. They just decided, Putin decided he wanted Ukraine. That's not right. But I don't think we should get involved. Really, I agree with it all, really, you know. Because they, they were trying to kill us, and we were trying to kill them. That's basically all, all boiled down to. I really don't understand how we got involved. In, I do, after watch TV, that is how it was Kennedy that really got us involved in Vietnam. Because he sent over the advisors, and then once LBJ got in, he escalated it. I hate to say it, but I think they lost. The way we pulled out, and as we were pulling out, the NVA was coming down. Like uh, Ho Chi Minh said, We'll wear you guys down. You might kill five of us, and we might kill one of you, but eventually you're gonna wear down, and that's what we did. We were fighting no win, no win war. Yeah, that, that's the sad thing about it. There's a lot of, over 40,000 Americans died, I think. For future generations, think before you act. That's it. A lot of, a lot of these government people, they don't think, they just, they only think of themselves. They don't think of what the military person say, go over there and put their blood and guts into it. You know, most of them has never been in the military, so they don't really know what it is. What message would I want? Treat people as you want them to treat you. That's why I've always thought about it in my life. That's, that's it, you know, just treat people the way you want to. And as far as war, think twice about war. Watch, watch your politicians. Life lessons. I always respect people. If they respect you, you respect them back. And people love you, love them back. But you always gotta remember, you know, life is only a, it's just a heartbeat away from being dead. And when you're over in Vietnam, you thought about it, but you kind of put it in the back of your mind. But you're young, so in a way you don't think about it. It's hard to explain, but that's how, you, that's how it is over there. It's something you have to experience to really know. And a lot of people don't really like talking about it, you know, 
because every once in a while you get an idea out and, and you think about it, you know, think back, oh gosh, I remember these guys doing this, these guys doing that, you know, and we were only 19. Here I am now 74, I'm gonna be 74 next month. It's just hard to believe. You look back on it, you know, the, the dumb things you've done. <laughs> I raised a family, I worked at Warner Lambert for 28 years, 27. Watch all you guys grow up. Just enjoyed it. What kind of emotions do you feel coming here? Kind of sadness. And there's so many young kids that died. They had so much life yet to go. Like me, I'm going to be 75. A lot of these kids all the things they missed, their kids, grandkids. And so a lot of things they missed in over 60 years. When you see him, does it make you sad or like miss him? Yeah, it makes me sad. I knew him pretty good. We were in all three grades in high school. We were sophomores, uh, juniors and seniors together. We graduated. Yeah. This kid I graduated with and went to school with, he died in Vietnam. When you, when you like looked at the chopper and you were like up there, did it have any memories? Like, did you remember anything looking at it? Uh, a little bit. By the way, I tried to forget. Let's have peace around the world. You know, war is, war is not fun. These young kids have been in Iraq, Afghanistan. They know. They probably might have even had it worse than we did. I don't know. Just God bless them all.